Okay, we can just start. Um, hi everyone, I'm Ria Bhatia. I'm part of Microsoft, but I'm also a core maintainer on Virtual Kubelet. I've been part of this project since its inception in the beginning. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys about it. And we also have one of our providers, um, which is Azure's virtual node providers uh, here. Hi, I'm, I'm Sarvan. I'm a PM in Microsoft Azure, uh, working in the container compute team. Um, and we, we use uh, the virtual Kubelet library for one of our offerings, uh, virtual nodes, which I'll talk about today as well. Cool. You control the slides. <laughs> Okay, um, some more things about me. So that's my handle on Twitter if you want to reach out. Um, I have a dog named Rue. She's a rescue puppy from Taiwan, actually. Um, and then here are links, which might not be too useful because you can't click on any of these. But when we put them up on uh, on like the website, the CNCF website, you'll be able to see it. Um, but basically, that's also my GitHub handle. So if you want to reach out there, um, you can. And uh, this is just a bit more about me. Um, you can also reach out to me on GitHub or LinkedIn as well. Uh, and I work on the two Azure products called Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Container Instances. Cool. Virtual Kubelet. So this is our logo. Um, it was voted on by the community, and we decided to do this. I kind of like it because it kind of looks like Star Trek. Um, but fast forwarding to the next slide. What happened? Why did we open source this? So a long time ago, um, we had this project called the Azure Container Instances Connector, which was created by Brendan Burns, one of the co-founders of Kubernetes. Um, he had this idea that we should start to abstract the core infrastructure of, uh, of what people run Kubernetes on. So today, we run it on a bunch of VMs, but customers don't necessarily want to run all that infrastructure or see it. They really just want to see their containers or possibly just their apps. Um, so this was kind of the first. Oh, look over there. Oh, go here. Stand over oh, here. oh, sorry. <laughs> OK, apparently I have to be here. Um, but basically, he he was like, what if customers, uh, basically customers were like, we don't want to see infrastructure. We don't have to, we don't want to manage it. Um, so the ACI connector happened. We also released a service called Azure Container Instances. And a bunch of other platforms kind of followed that lead, like AWS Fargate, Alibaba, Cloud, uh, Elastic Container Instances. So these are all examples of services that just spin up containers on the fly. Um, and they charge it by second. And you get to specify the amount of cores and memory that you want for that specific container. But you don't, you don't see any of the underlying VM infrastructure. From there, we took the ACI Connector project and realized that we wanted to be able to scale out these kinds of container instances, but we didn't want to make our own distributed system. So we wanted to utilize Kubernetes for scaling and for service discovery and for all of the other good bits that Kubernetes has. So that's when we created Virtual Kubelet. Um, we also realized that if we wanted to open source it and have a community around it, we should also allow other providers to plug into it. So we really just created this interface into what it means uh, to be like the Kubelet in Kubernetes. All right, so yeah, we're also part of the CNCF, and that's why we get to do talks like this at KubeCon. Um, so this is an intro talk. And yeah, we're also going towards incubating. So in the next year, um, we're going to be gathering some case studies and going to hopefully one day be an incubating project. And we also just announced 1.0. So basically with us saying that we're 1.0, we're saying that we're stable, we're not going to change the interface drastically, and that anyone that plugs into our interface can be certain that Virtual Kubla on its own um, is basically production ready. So if you want to run production workloads on this, you can. We've also revamped the entire repo. So Everyone used to be plugged into the same binary. So when we build everything, it would be one binary, like all of the providers. Alibaba's provider, Huawei's provider, Azure's provider was one binary. We have just split everything out. So now everyone has their own repo. And if you build a virtual kubelet binary, it's specific to your provider. Um, so that'll help with a lot of like efficiency things, things like that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, a lot, yeah, so basically this is a, um, a snapshot of what happened about two years ago at, before KubeCon at Austin. We got together a bunch of people at Microsoft, and then we also partnered with a company named HyperSH, 
which is no longer with us <laughs> as a company. But um, we moved the project from being TypeScript to being written in Go, and that's when we released it. So Virtual Kubit's all written in Go. Um, and it was also written by some cool people that were part of this cloud developer advocate team at Microsoft. One was uh, Jesse Frizzell, and then there's also Ashley over there, Eric St. Martin, uh, Brian Kettleston. They've written some cool books, and they've done a lot in the Go community. So yeah, it was awesome to have them. So uh, go ahead, diving a little bit into the, the architecture. So one of the cool things about uh, the Virtual Kubelet project is um, the way you use it is just like uh, managing any ordinary Kubernetes cluster. You can manage everything through kubectl. Um, and as you know, on, on a, a master node, there are, uh, there are a number of components there, um, API server, um, SCD, and whatnot. But then as a, um, as a user uh, to interact with the workers, um, you can just use kubectl. And then uh, each of the nodes will have a kube proxy in which you can actually talk to, um, talk to your pods and containers and have them uh, speaking to each other. So what we've done with the virtual kubelet is uh, We've created a, a pod that when it gets placed on a Kubernetes uh, cluster, it registers itself as a node. So the Kubernetes cluster thinks that there is actually um, another kubelet there, and that kubelet represents uh, a node. And that way, you can schedule pods out to uh, this virtual node. Um, since it's not an actual, uh, since it's not a, a real node, the capacity of this is actually backed by a number of uh, a number of uh, providers' different infrastructure including Azure Container Instances or Alibaba uh, Elastic Container Instances, Amazon Fargate, uh, and whatnot. Um, and uh, going along with, uh, with what Rio was saying, uh, we, want, we want to make Kubernetes uh, more, more pod-centric. Nodes is a, a concept right now in Kubernetes, but as developers, um, one shouldn't have to uh, manage and provision nodes uh, all the time. You want to be dealing with pods as much as you can. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to the last slide too. Sure. Yeah, so some things that we've done in the community in general, in the virtual public community, is we've, just like Shrevan said about providers, we have a lot of questions around like how do we show resources in Kubernetes today? Because in Node, we have a finite amount of resources. With providers now, there's this question of does the virtual public project mandate how many cores are exposed to the customer, and how fast you can scale up. Because one of our primary use cases for virtual kubelet is scaling up really fast and bursting out into this unknown amount of space, basically, compute resource space. With this, how do we tell providers like how they should expose those resources to customers? Because if a customer says, I need to scale up to maybe a million containers, but the provider is showing that it could scale up to a million containers, Kubernetes will schedule all of those pods, but that might not be true. So then as a customer, you might only get 1,000 containers scheduled because that number was faulty. Um, so that's something that we're thinking about. And there's a couple other things, like a couple things that we don't do, like privileged containers expect to interact directly with node resources. We don't allow that with VK. Um, you cannot directly talk to the node. You can't directly access any of the node files or anything like that. So um, some monitoring things don't work exactly as expected. Um, so yeah, there's just a couple things that you have to think about. And then a node is a single fault domain. It's not true in VK. It's, the fault domain is actually probably the container. But how do we expose that? Because the providers get to choose where the fault domains lie. Um, so there's just some questions that we've always had. Yeah, so um, uh, going off of what Rhea was saying, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing in the, the virtual Kubelet right now, project right now is to be more compatible with the full uh, Kubernetes API, uh, whether that's uh, being, obviously being able to create, delete pods, uh, gather metrics from pods, attach volumes, um, support uh, GPU type of pods, uh, et cetera, you name it. Um, yeah. You want to add anything? Cool. Yeah. All right. So, virtual kubit. That was kind of what the node does, and I tried to give a little bit of an explanation of what VK did layered on top of it. Um, but virtual kubit itself, we treat the concept of pods and nodes in the abstract. So we're literally just passing through a string when you see a node, uh, a virtual kubit node. It's just a string that's being passed through to Kubernetes. Um, 
a node is a bounded resource again, but the way that we've set it up, it isn't technically. Um, so the specifics of how you create a pod, delete a pod, update a pod, add files, like volumes, for example, um, and things like that, or like config maps and secrets and all that are all contained within the interface itself, but the logic for how all of that happens is your service API. So all of the provider APIs get connected up to the Kubernetes APIs through those through that interface. Um, the common code in virtual Kubla is relatively small because it's very provider specific code. We basically are a home for all of these providers to interact together, but the logic for how things work are held within the provider repos itself. Um, one interesting one is uh, basically service discovery, because how do you do that when you just have a concept of like a node popping up Kubernetes? You need a kube proxy basically on the node to be able to talk out to the, to the world and have service discovery. Um, in Azure, I know what we've done is we spin up a kube proxy as a sidecar to every container instance that spins up. But the way that maybe Alibaba does that or Huawei does that might be different. Um, I actually think they do a very, very similar thing, but that's completely abstracted away from the user. In Kubernetes today, in managed service, you would actually see that kube proxy or, and that kubelet. For this, you just see this node with no kubelet and no kube proxy and none of that. It's all abstracted away, which is kind of nice if it works. Sure. Yes. Uh, it mean the one Kubernetes can um, can um, have more Kubernetes uh, because one Kubernetes is a uh, node uh, uh, in the uh, in the class. Uh, uh, if it has a powder, uh -huh. it mean one Kubernetes can be more yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So you can have a bigger Kubernetes cluster okay, with this okay. one node um, has that you can layer multiple pods, X amount of pods that isn't bounded by a node resource. I think that answers okay. your question. Hopefully, you could yeah. layer Kubernetes in Kubernetes if that was another question you were asking. If you can like have virtual kubelet spin out to another Kubernetes cluster, mm -hmm. that's completely possible. Um, because it's just an API that you're calling out to. We'll we'll talk, we'll show uh, an architecture diagram of what a cluster would look like with a, a virtual node on it in a bit. Yeah. Okay. okay. YVK. We basically abstracted away what it means to be a kubelet in Kubernetes, and that's actually really interesting to a lot of people. For example, if you're trying to mask another orchestrator and you want to use the Kubernetes APIs, but you don't want to lose everything you've built with another orchestrator, so um, if you go check out our repo right now, there's some interesting hap things happening from other providers that are trying to do that. Um, yeah, so a couple of use cases. We have uh, the one I talked about before for fast bursting. If you have a sudden amount of uh, load, basically, for example, if you're a meter reading company and you need to scale up the amount of compute resources that you have depending on if there's a natural disaster. So if there's a natural disaster, you need to now read all of the meters to understand how much electricity is there and what's gone down and what you need to go and fix. In that use case, virtual kubelet's really useful because you weren't planning for that, so you didn't have to have that capacity already there for you. Um, you can just automatically spin out into VK and the provider itself would have hopefully abstracted away the amount of compute resources. So you would have this unbounded amount of compute resources. And then we have some IoT Edge use cases and then also masking virtual kubelet as a different kind of node. So you could mask it as a GPU node or a GPU con containers, things like that, or a different SKU. It's all magic. <laughs> <laughs> you want to this one? OK, sure. Um, so this is what, if you want to be a provider, this is what you end up doing. You end up filling in this code. If you can understand how to create a pod and delete a pod and update, well, update is a little bit questionable because no one's really done that yet, but basically delete a pod and get a pod and possibly get logs, you can be a provider in virtual kubelet. It's a really low bar. Um, so if you're Domino's and you want to, if you create a pod and you want to get a pizza when that, like, when you get that pod, you can do it. I don't know if I explained that very well, but um, anyone can be a provider, so please join us. 
And this is really what you have to do. You just have to provide the back end plumbing necessary and support the lifecycle management of pods and Kubernetes. That's all your logic. It's not something we do. But all of the code is open source, so you can copy and paste from any of the other providers or look at it. Yeah. So extend Kubernetes to anything that you want. Um, I've heard of some interesting, a couple other use cases that I've heard of is they want to mask. Someone wanted to mask uh, a satellite that was orbiting Earth as a node in Kubernetes. So you can think, you, now with Virtual Kubelet, you can use Kubernetes and the Kubernetes API as a common platform for any developer or any infrastructure operator, and you can mask other, diff like other compute resources if you so choose, um, which is really interesting. So you can mask dominoes. Um, that's an example I really like because I love pizza. But for example, if you created a pod, it would spin out to Domino's and order you pizza, but you have to create that logic. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are using it for the fast burst use case where they just spin up a bunch of containers really quickly. Um, but you can also mask maybe IoT Edge use cases. So you could have a node representing a device. So you could have a node representing a fridge, and any time you spin out a pod to that fridge, it would maybe update the fridge of software or something, or maybe you would add a new feature to it. So we're really just trying to make Kubernetes the basic common control plane for any sort of workload and any sort of device, um, hopefully in the world. Yeah, and uh, here's some examples of the providers that have already uh, implemented the, the virtual Kubelet interface, uh, Alibaba, Azure, uh, AWS, just to name a few, few big ones. Um, this is a sample architecture diagram of what it would look like with an IoT Edge de uh, deployment. So as Ria was saying, um, we want the, uh, the user to just, who's already familiar with Kubernetes, um, not have to learn anything new. You can uh, manage all, con all software and containers on your Edge devices just by using uh, the IoT Edge provider um, with your already existing Kubernetes cluster. You don't have to worry about uh, nodes or what or anything like that. You can just spawn off workloads or con and containers to those uh, edge devices. Um, I saw yesterday that there was a, a cool lightning talk of the guy that built a, a Kubernetes cluster with just a bunch of rab Raspberry Pis and using tape and like rubber band together. Um, so he has his own Kubernetes cluster and you can, you can use that for testing, for example. Um, yeah. So this is what it looks like uh, with Azure. So um, in Azure, we have a service called uh, Azure Kubernetes Service. It's a managed Kubernetes offering where Azure uh, takes care of managing all of the master nodes. So you as a customer only have to worry about the worker nodes and uh, the workloads that are on them. But even as you uh, have to manage and own and uh, plan for capacity on the worker nodes, uh, this can get very expensive. Worker nodes can be uh, underutilized. and the startup time to add more worker nodes if you need to scale on demand pretty quickly uh, can be very slow. So we've introduced an offering called uh, Azure Virtual, or AKS Virtual Nodes, which uses the Virtual Kubelet project. And now you can, uh, you can burst out capacity of your pods to uh, Azure Container Instances. Azure Container Instances is our, uh, Azure's serverless uh, containers offering, where a user can just send uh, deploy containers and uh, we manage all the infrastructure. So as you as a user only have to worry about developing your application, packaging into a container, and, uh, and giving it to Azure. Yes? Yeah, this, this is a generally available offering. It, so so there's, there's two products. There's Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Container Instances. If you're using AKS, then there's a feature you can enable to turn on this virtual nodes experience. Yes. Uh, currently, it, it's not available with with that. No, but uh, that that's on our road. So, tech, since this is an open source project, you can pave it onto any Kubernetes oh, cluster. Okay. Um, so it doesn't matter if we offer it. We don't support it. I mean, I guess we support it now in Azure, but with OpenShift, we wouldn't exactly support it. But as long as you have access to your VMs, you can deploy Virtual Kubelet, and it will spin out to ACI. You have to fill in the details yourself. So go to our virtual kubelet repo itself for those instructions. So yes. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Uh, the, what Azure provides here is we we do a lot of that setup for you and configure a lot of networking and and do some other plumbing. 
to make the experience of uh, installing VK and deploying pods to ACI uh, more seamless. But yeah, theoretically, any Kubernetes cluster, even if it's OpenShift, you can install virtual Kubelet and uh, burst out to ACI or any one of the other providers. Yeah, so uh, an example use case um, of this is there's a, a company in, in Africa. So the, they're, a, they're a bank, and whenever they do a, a marketing campaign for, uh, for loans or, or whatever, or credit cards, they see a spike in, uh, in traffic to their, their services. So instead of having, uh, let, you know, let's say they run a three node cluster right now, instead of having five nodes and two of those nodes uh, being very underutilized and then paying for them 24-7, now they just can take their three node cluster and then spin off extra pods into ACI. Whenever that marketing campaign is done, maybe it's over a weekend or something, they can spin that back down. Uh, other examples are in the retail industry. So during Black Friday or, or Singles Day, for example, you're gonna see maybe two times, three times, maybe even more as much traffic in. Uh, you don't wanna be provisioning uh, infrastructure that's gonna be underutilized. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And uh, just to wrap this up, um, this diagram shows you that you know, some of the virtual machines, there's going to be uh, empty space that's wasted. Uh, but if you're using virtual nodes, you can just uh, spin out the pods to uh, Azure Container <laughs> instances and then create and destroy them as you wish. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is also this is a lot faster in terms of speed uh, because you're, you don't have to spin up new virtual machines to put the pods on them. Azure Container Instances, we already have virtual machines that are running hot um, that are abstracted away from users, and the pods will just get placed on those. Uh, so this is uh, part of the uh, pod spec that you would need to include um, when using uh, virtual kubelet. And I'll, I'll, show act I'll show a full YAML file in a bit. Uh, but what this shows is um, in, on the virtual node, uh, we add what's called a, a taint in Kubernetes. Uh, you can think of it as a, kind of like a lock. And if you add tolerations to your pod spec, this is basically the key to uh, be able to provision uh, workloads onto the node with that lock. The reason why we do this is, as Rio was saying, uh, the full compatibility of the Kubernetes API. There's not, not everything is available with, uh, with virtual kubelet. So some special types of workloads might not work the way that they're expected, and if you use Azure Container Instances, for example. Um, yeah. Yes. One of the things I think uh, you didn't explain well is that uh, uh, why, why the virtual kubelet can actually, you know, uh, you know, satisfy this kind of burst bursting you know, kind of scenario. Why you know it can like launch the ports, you know, uh, so quickly in, in in the normal way. I think so. Uh, yeah, that's so a, that's actually my question. Is that it, because of the provider? The, yeah, the ACI. It's the providers are the ones that have the the infrastructure in which the pods are placed. Yeah. Um, so typically speaking, uh, and feel free to add more. Uh, many of the, all the providers or many of the providers are. Um, the, the each company's serverless container offerings, like Fargate, for example, uh, or ACI. Um, so since the nodes are already exist, uh, all that need the work that actually happens is um, the container image is downloaded to that node, and then the container is just started up. Rather than having to boot up a full OS and then in, uh, install the image and start the container. Yeah, I get that. I think the uh, the differentiator comes from the provider itself rather yeah. than from the virtual kubelet. It can, but there's a couple. I, as a vendor neutral person, I'm going to take a step back from being Microsoft right now. Um, this is a really good solution for Microsoft, right? Because RVMs might be slower to boot up. Um, if you look at other providers, they might be as fast as containers are today. And then this use case doesn't exactly work for everyone. Um, Another thing, I think another reason for why this project, a lot of people like it, is the fact that it abstracts away the kubelet so much. Um, so past the burst use case, it's really useful for Microsoft, but it's not super useful for some other companies. Another thing is customers don't want to have to see VMs or manage them. So 
in that standpoint, that's why like Amazon and Alibaba have implemented this, not just because maybe their infrastructure is already fast, um, but because they don't want their customers to have to think about nodes anymore. You just think about containers, so you just see pods. That's all you care about. So if a node goes down, you actually don't know and you don't care about that. That's probably the vendor neutral. Hello. Yeah. So um, I see a, this is a really good use case, but um, I'm just worried like how does, or rather I have a question that how does the underlying things like the network and like how does even Azure in AKS, how does it uh, address those things? Like um, how do I enforce um, to which network it goes to or the NSGs? We have a concept of NSGs in Azure, right? How does that enforce that? Where goes the security? Do we put network policies, or how do we do it? Yeah, so that, that's that's one way you can do that. Um, with uh, Azure Container Instances, the Azure networking team has done a lot of special work in order for the pods that are deployed to ACI um, to be uh, with to be contained within the same virtual network as uh, the full AKS cluster. So any, any features that you can get with Azure Virtual Networks, whether it's uh, NSGs or custom routing, um, DNS, uh, et cetera, um, that, 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 that's all provided. Uh, granted, not the, the full parity isn't, isn't there with, if you're just using a virtual network with, uh, with AKS, um, but that's something that uh, we're working to, to reach. Yeah. So you mean that the when I deploy the AKS and I choose a network, uh, whatever network segmentation, VNet, and all those I choose, basically the pods get spin up into the same thing, right? And it yeah. will follow whatever the the network we specify at the beginning. Yeah. So anything that you any uh, Azure virtual network features that you would use or apply to, if you're just using a single AKS cluster, you can do the same if you're using the AKS cluster and uh, virtual nodes in, in ACI. Thanks. VK can only run the ECR uh, container. No, so uh, VK has a, a number of other uh, providers. So, uh, and we're, we're going to talk about uh, another one as well um, uh, from, from Alibaba. Is there a question? So, so yeah, when you install a uh, virtual kubelet onto your Kubernetes cluster, you specify uh, which provider you want to use. Uh, ACI is one of them. And in Azure, when you're using, it's just one. Yeah, there, there are many different ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I look at the interface, right, the Horizon interface, I didn't see actually, uh, so that, that's a provider have to like uh, uh, implement all the details, the technical details about network, you know, yeah. storage kind of stuff so just mentioned. That is explicit. That's something that we chose uh, to not implement because the network is very provider specific, right? If you go to Alibaba's cloud or you go to Amazon's cloud or you go to Google's cloud, the network policies and the way that people create networks is very specific to a cloud provider. We don't have networks that span Google and Microsoft yet, right? Like you can't create a network for a cluster that's in Azure and have it span there, so it's provider specific. You have to figure it out yourself from our perspective. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I get my hardware information from a pod uh, of ACI, like my CPU type and my disk you type? Get that from the node itself. So the node, you can still see the node resource there, and when you basically describe that node, you'll still be able to see what OS type it is, how much compute resources you have, and how much disk, disk space you have. Um, I would just be wary about that because they're fake numbers. They're numbers that the provider chooses to pass through. Um, for the OS type, it's the same thing. Like, we'll make it easier for you to spin out to that specific OS type if we say Windows and you deploy a pod to that, that node. It'll spin out to Windows, but sometimes you can add different flags in your pod spec itself and actually spin out to Linux on that Windows node. It's like super abstract. Basically. But if I care about the performance, how can I uh, compare the performance of my uh, true node and my virtual node? So the, when, you, uh, when you deploy a pod to the virtual node, um, you, it's just like any other pod. You, would spe you can specify how much CPU and memory that'll be in that pod. And you can uh, use the kubectl 
commands to see how much is actually being utilized. Mm -hmm. So that, that information is returned from ACI, but at a pod level. Uh, yes, uh, I think you are, you are saying the uh, resource, but uh, what I care about is the like my CPU frequencies and my disk I/O, like like this information, um, because in the AKS I can see the node, I can I can choose the node type like A A two or or D type, but in the virtual node I can I yeah. cannot see this information. So uh, since these pods are living on ACI, uh, ACI or at least in the ACI case. Uh, we emit uh, a number of metrics out um, which can be consumed either within the cluster itself or within Azure Monitor offerings. Uh, so that includes like network, uh, network <laughs> I.O., um, memory, <laughs> CPU, uh, a few others, um, disk I believe as well. Uh, so so that, that's one way you can, you can read that, yeah. Uh, okay, so can I understand that uh, in ACI you can uh, you can make sure that the, every pod can provide the same performance per CPU and memory, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> performance is iffy. You have to figure that out, kind of. We don't, we don't have an SLA for any of that. <laughs> so. Um, so, and real quick, uh, another piece of code that you can add to your YAMLs is with uh, affinities. So, um, using this, you can choose certain pods uh, to go onto the virtual node. Uh, the thing I showed before is just the key in order to deploy onto the node with the lock. Um, if you want a specific pod to get placed on the virtual node, you can do, you can add this affinity. You can either do the preferred during scheduled uh, or scheduling or required during scheduling. Um, and, uh, and yeah. Um, one thing I, I want to show you guys. Uh, if I can pull it up very quickly. Uh, nope. Anyone have a question while we're, yeah. Uh, in normal Kubernetes cluster, we have monitor like Prometheus and they can uh, fetch metrics from the Kubernetes that mm -hmm. Uh, the metrics about the node and about the pods and our work workload on that. But on Corfu Kubernetes, I see the interface that there is no such an interface that uh, exposes the metrics to the uh, monitor uh, components. So if we, I choose to use a component uh, a spe and specify a provider, so I can only depend on the monitors that provided by the provider or I can still integrate it with Prometheus or other uh, Kubernetes monitor system. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I can speak for, for ACI. Um, we make sure that the metrics that are emitted are written back to the metric server of the Kubernetes cluster. So you can use Prometheus um, and, and Grafana and actually read uh, CPU and memory. You can also uh, write custom metrics um, such as like re requests per second uh, that are being uh, tracked by your ACI pods through the metric server, and then that can be all read through a familiar monitoring solution like Prometheus. Um, okay, does, so does it's to the provide us responsibility to uh, handle the metrics and where to write f write to, and yeah. uh, so, so, so VK there is not a standard interface we, for that. We well, haven't made a standard for any of that. Um, mm. For example, once we're at v V1 right now, but as we get to maybe V2, maybe these are standards we should make in Virtual Kubelet for providers, because today only the interface is production ready. We haven't, Virtual Kubelet, the project, hasn't said that any of the providers are production ready because we have no standards around those. So like Azure has gone out on their own and said that they're GA, but Virtual Kubelet, the project, does not have a, like an interaction with Azure to make sure that they're actually ready to be GA. And I think that's a, a set of standards that we're going to start creating in the next, in the next year. Um, you're completely correct. Like, okay, you I probably agree. should have some sort of standard for that. Okay, yeah. got that. So Thank you. Ju just to uh, wrap up, and then we can take more questions at the end. This is a sample YAML file that you can use with Virtual Kubelet. A lot of this should look familiar to you. Um, you can just you can use that images as uh, as normal. I use it, an image that's in Azure Container Registry. Uh, you can read from Kubernetes Secrets, and here I use the node selector uh, placement constraint instead of Affinity, and then uh, my toleration is here as well. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it back to yeah. 
to Alibaba. Oh, okay. Sure. All right, because I think we're out of time. Um, so we can take a couple more questions. It's 35 minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're time out. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we can take some questions up here if you guys want to come up um, or stick around. But thank you so much for listening. Um, it's good to see that a lot of people are still excited about this project. And I mean, we're gardening more and more popularity as time goes on, which is really awesome. Um, so come join us. We're a really open community. We have a Slack channel on Kubernetes. And yeah, we'd love to talk to you. So thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, virtual Kublet. <laughs> it's just virtual dash Kublet. Yeah. That's the organization. <laughs> yeah, feel free to connect with us over GitHub um, and yeah. Twitter. And yeah. I don't have. Oh, oh, the internet's working now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just write it. VirtualCoolBud.com. That's good. Okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. Thank you.